Right, well, welcome to Whitehall. Uh, uh, I, you may, some of you may recall a, a couple of years ago, uh, I, I gave a talk about the area specifically where I work, which is in Petty France, because I am, a, my sins a government lawyer. I, so I, Whitehall and thereabouts is sort of my uh, home territory. But it's also uh, the, the, the history, I, I got involved with the history of, of Petty France, which was rather specific. And then I thought, well, I should really tackle the big beast Whitehall itself, which uh, has really been um, really uh, a fascinating uh, delve into an extraordinary history for one street. And what uh, I, I really found was how topical it is. Of course, it's making history even today. In, in the last year, we've had the, the coronation. Uh, and to be absolutely topical, uh, we're going to be uh, actually including uh, some tennis, uh, we've got Wimbledon week, uh, tennis has been quite important in Whitehall, and um, American Independence Day today, 4th of July. So uh, we'll see how that all connects to Whitehall as well. So uh, there's a, 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 an old edition of, of a tour, and um, we'll just kick off from there. Now, this is the most recent fly past that, um, uh, over uh, after the Troop of the Colour. I am actually in the crowd down there, keep trying to keep off the grass. But I thought what thought this is rather symbolic because there you have uh, the area which I'm going to talk about, which goes from Parliament Square uh, just all the way along to Trafalgar Square. So it is just that area at the end of the park which uh, and we're, we're actually looking at. And, and it, it's a bit like a, a Red Hours fly past, but historically uh, is what we're doing. So you'll just get a glimpse of things as we go. And it's things which, um, uh, which I find of interest, and I hope you do too. And you'll see uh, as we go, you'll tell some of my particular interests. Uh, uh, and um, it, so it's partly a sort of virtual tour as we're walking along the street, as it were. And, um, and it's sort of chronological, but uh, with some deviations. And of course, we, we, we start, how could we not, with the coronation. Uh, and the Whitehall has been uh, the scene of a coronation procession for a thousand years. Uh, when William the Conqueror did his first um, coronation at Westminster Abbey, he went through, along the Strand uh, and along what was... Uh, before it was called Whitehall, nevertheless, a strand along the river. So it, it's been uh, in the coronation ceremony for a thousand years. And what that strikes you most of all, and they say about the coronation, it, it's theatre. And so much of what Whitehall is about, seems to me, is theatre. So I think it's highly appropriate that Whitehall has its own theatre. Um, it was, I thought, appropriately called the Whitehall Theatre. And I, also, I'm using the Oscars there as a sort of symbol of the drama uh, which Whitehall has created. It's created it in its history itself, and it's also contributed to the dramatic arts, as we'll see. So, I'm, And in, in particular, uh, if it were not for Whitehall and the people in it, um, there would not be very many Oscars awarded, not only for actors, but all sorts of other uh, activities around uh, the film industry. So it is a very dramatic place. But I thought we'd just have a quick look at the theatre before we go. It's now uh, called the Trafalgar Theatre. Uh, and it's during lockdown, they took the opportunity to restore it to its magnificent Art Deco interior. Now, go back into time. Uh, the, the area around Whitehall does appear in Doomsday Book. And it's, it was attached to the Abbey, um, so it's got a long lineage even uh, before that. But probably the, the, the first documented uh, sign that it was a, of, of a governmental importance uh, was 1158. We have a deed uh, which where the Abbey transferred a lot of the estate to Henry II. So there we are. We've already scored two Oscars right there. Now... Uh, then he, he passed it to his Chancellor of the Exchequer, who felt guilty about not going on the crusade. So as a penance, uh, he left the his Whitehall estate. I'm calling it Whitehall. wasn't called Whitehall at that time, but that area uh, to the Sea of York uh, for his sins uh, in 1240. And for several hundred years, it was the London home 
of uh, the Archbishop of York. It was called York Place. And actually, it was very similar to what we now call Lambeth Palace, which, of course, is across the river, uh, which was the Archbishop of Canterbury's Palace. And that hasn't been really modified all that much. It's been built upon. So you can sort of get a feel of what York Place probably looked like for several hundred years uh, until Henry VIII arrived. He was crowned uh, at the age of 17 and he wanted to upset the established aristocracy. So he got this rather common priest, uh, Woolsey, to be his Lord Chancellor. And Lord Woolsey took the opportunity to use the revenues which he could get from his office to build up York Place into quite an impressive palace. Um, those of you who know Hampton Court, uh, I know Woolsey, of course, developed that as well. And it was certainly uh, pretty much uh, as grand as that. So that was sort of the beginning of uh, the palace of what was to become Whitehall Palace. Um, but of course, the uh, um, longevity of Lord Chancellors under Henry VIII you'd think wasn't that great. In fact, I looked it up, there, there were eight Lord Chancellors uh, Henry VIII had, and I, I looked, um, since 2018, uh, we've had eight uh, Lord Chancellors appointed. So maybe job security wasn't all that different. And we scored another Oscar there. Now, according to the horrible histories, Cardinal Woolsey then, uh, having been sacked, went on a, on a speaking tour, which I rather like, uh, maybe the first politician to do so, of, um, and you'll see uh, it, it's Bill there. He says, how I turned my modest home into a massive palace. Sounds like daytime TV. Now, what happened to him? He died under speaking to her. He died at, at Leicester, as it happens. Of course, we know now that uh, Richard III also was buried at Leicester. And of course, rather uh, fittingly in karma, as you might say, the abbey was then promptly abolished um, and torn down. But the Woolsey's grave remains outside, down, down the bottom right, uh, and uh, it's, uh, I think it's rather a delightful thought that, of course, Henry VIII would have no idea that Richard III was buried there too, so they keep each other company in history. Now, the uh, palace then developed, of course, Henry VIII took it over, uh, he rather jealously acquired it, and in particular, he, he built it up, uh, these towers, these gatehouses become very important in the palace. So along here, th this will be the, the king's apartments along here, these formal gardens that Woolsey introduced, the remnant of it still exists in front of the MOD main building, a bit of grass, um, and then it develops over here, this will be horse guard, you'll see the jousting um, tilting yard there with the uh, separation for the horses. So if we move along, and those are the two great gates. There's the Holborn Gate, uh, which is round about the uh, end of the banqueting hall. Um, and then the King Street Gate is round about Downing Street. So those two gates into the palace uh, were, became very important, and particularly the Holborn Gate. Now, we don't actually know if Holborn decorated. He may well have done. He did do a lot of decorations. Uh, but it became an important part of the palace because it connected the part near the river with the, the great sports centre that Henry built up on, on the other side. And the gatehouse, the Holborn Gatehouse, was very beautifully furnished and is a very comfortable living space. So it became a really important part of the, of the palace. And some of these historical uh, events that you, you may well know uh, actually occurred uh, probably in the Holborn Gatehouse. Now, this is jumping in time a little bit, 100 years, but it's giving us a shape of how uh, the palace would look. So we're up to 1680 now, but it's still time. Henry's time, you, you're still going to get the general shape of it. So if we just go along here, along the river, th these are the king's apartments down here at the bottom left, the queen's apartments, and then it just grew like topsy. The aristocracy started building up their apartments, and then there was a whole wing built up along here, up to the Whitehall through fair um, of, of, of a long gallery, and then, the, then you got to the Holborn Gatehouse, and then through into Henry's magnificent entertainment centre, 
Uh, and of course, there's a famous uh, inner tennis court there. Uh, he also had an outside tennis court. In fact, there were several tennis courts. They, they loved tennis, uh, absolutely loved it. And uh, there's the cockpit, which, of course, that was originally for uh, cockfighting. And this is sort of the back end of Downing Street we're looking at there. Uh, the tilt yard and the horse guard. So, of course, that, that's still today uh, is horse guards parade there. And the, there's the street here. Now, the street has actually been built over now. So the Whitehall that we know, which, in fact, the, the end of it, we, we call it Parliament Street, the very end of it. But that goes through there. Now, to get your bearings, there's the banqueting house. Now, although that it was rebuilt several times, I think that that one actually is the one that 1680 would have been the one that's still there today. So that gives you that's the one thing that survived the great fires. So that gives you your bearings about where you are. Uh, so if you're trying to work work out anything, just think, oh, where's the banqueting house? And you know, if you know that, then uh, you you can work out where things are. Now I'm going to down here. You'll see it says the Great Hall. We're going to be coming back to the Great Hall because that has a particular significance. Now to just give you an idea of the modern geography. The the why that's what they call that the MOD main building. And that more or less exactly uh, covers the area of the core of the Whitehall Palace. So just to give you an idea, that, that MOD main building is covering that area there. Now, of course, remember that the river came much higher up in those days. So the river would have come up to the perimeter of the building exactly, actually. If you see there's a little brown patch down there. Now that is Queen Mary Steps, which you can see today. And that was preserved when they uh, dug up the site to put the main building in. Uh, that is the steps of uh, Queen Mary II, uh, as in William and Mary, had, had these steps built so she could step sedately onto her barge there. So that gives you a, a very clear idea of where, where the river is and it goes right along that, that building line. Now, I believe there was a, a speaker to the society several years ago, Simon Thurley, who did a magnificent job uh, on the archeological study. Because what happened was the MOD main building took uh, a very long time to build because it started in the First World War and it wasn't finished until well after the Second World War. Uh, that, that's a long story, but obviously you can imagine that the wars didn't help. The one of the things that held it up also was the amazing archaeology that was uncovered. And you'll see there that looks like some sort of Persian archaeological site. That was Whitehall. Uh, so they uncovered an uh, enormous amount of uh, rooms, the, the foundations of rooms, uh, right across that whole site. Um, and unfortunately, because it was just the end of the war and so on, the archaeologists uh, never really wrote up their findings. And what Simon Thurley did was he gathered all that information that had been built up, which it had been studied and all excavated, and he put it in at this excellent book. So if you're ever interested, you really want to know what, how the palace worked, it, it, it's very well documented there. Um, now, one thing that did survive in the basement was Woolsey's Wool Cellar. Uh, and that is still there. It's in the MOD building. It, it was uh, had to be moved slightly. And the, the late Queen Mary, as in the 20th century Queen Mary, actually uh, did request that it was saved. So it duly was saved. And the MOD have the, the, the use of that today. So you can see it's still very much intact. Um, and also preserved on the other side is the part of the wall of the tennis court. Now you can actually see in the drawing there, actually the windows there, and you can see how they're actually playing outside as well. But it, it, if you go into the cabinet office building, uh, which is the one that uh, you, you go into from Whitehall, uh, you will see this um, end of the tennis court. That, that's very much intact. And of course, there is one still in perfect condition at Hampton Court. A tennis was really important and it was uh, for the royal family and the court and it was considered a royal sport. It came from France originally, it developed in the monastic court, courtyards and then 
Um, and then in the uh, 16th century, they introduced rackets. It used to be played with hands. And all the monarchs, so the Tudors and Stuarts, uh, they love tennis. And it rather surprises me of all the films that have been made about the Tudors and Stuarts. I've never seen one where they're playing tennis. Uh, and yet it, it was a passion for just about all of them. And in fact, Mary Queen of Scots also played tennis uh, when she was in Scotland. Uh, it was an absolute passion for them. In fact, the uh, I was watching a programme yesterday about Anne Boleyn, and it, it, it said that when she was brought out and charged with treason, she was actually playing tennis at the time. Of course, that royal tradition continues, uh, maybe not in the future, but uh, who knows. Uh, and another great tradition was the tilt yard, uh, and that, of course, has been developed into horse guards, and that was a great uh, passion of, of the Tudors. And um, Charles II introduced lifeguards. They were literally to, to uh, preserve his life because he, of course, felt really threatened when he came back. He established that before he got to the throne. And that trooping of the colour dates from that time. Uh, but getting back to our monarchs, because we score, keep scoring Oscars. Uh, so it's, it's the, what, what always astonishes me is how much uh, stories, uh, real life events, have been, been the source of enormous dramas. And they keep coming. We've got another uh, Henry VIII film out this year. And it, a lot of it happened all in, in Whitehall. And a particular event happened, we're talking about the Holman Gate, uh, was the secret wedding of Henry and Queen Anne, which took place in January. And I note the date there. That was in the Holborn Gate it took place. It was a very unusual place in those days for a wedding. But he got married uh, in the Holborn Gate. And now that was January. Watch the dates now. We go into... She was then crowned individually uh, as Queen Anne in June. Uh, that was an enormous ceremony, and the, the, the populace from the, the Tower of London all the way down to Westminster booed her, and she commented she was upset because the men did not doff their caps. Uh, so um, that was a very important symbol. Now, that was June, uh, and then Queen Elizabeth was uh, born in September. So you might say that Elizabeth actually was a present at two uh, coronations. She gets an Oscar as well uh, for her coronation. Now, I think the most remarkable film, perhaps, of Queen Elizabeth is the Helen Mirren version, because what they did for this film was they, because there's so much information they've got about Whitehall Palace, they could actually recreate it very exactly. And that's what they did. They uh, took over a indoor sports stadium in Lithuania for the film set. And they recreated a scale model of Whitehall uh, as a film studio uh, for the Helen Mirren films. And if you watch that film, you will see how she goes into the Holborn Gate and how she goes into Tilt Yard and the different courtyards. And it all makes sense. So it is um, fascinating. It gives a great authenticity to the drama. Now, I did mention the Great Hall previously, and that became really important for theatre because this is where the the, the great uh, Elizabeth Theatre was born of course she was a great patron uh, of Shakespeare's company um, and uh, that was quite contentious in those days because uh, of course um, Shakespeare and the the uh, other playwrights and so on the performers they, they couldn't have a theatre in the city it was banned by the by the city council they had to go south of the river so actually even to engage in theater which was a completely new art form just developed off the street um, was really innovatory and she really promoted it which was not a conservative thing to do it was, it was really considered very risque and she was a great patron she uh, really helped develop that now what i found really uh, exciting was when they dug up the street of Whitehall um, in 2010 to put the bollards in to protect the buildings all the way along. They had a good idea of the archaeology, but they, they weren't absolutely sure what they'd find. And what they did find at the end of the MOD building was the uh, foundations of the Great Hall, which 
I personally find very exciting, as, as exciting as when they found the foundations of the Globe Theatre. Um, that you think a lot, because a lot of the plays of Shakespeare and others were actually premiered before the Queen, before they even went to the Globe. So I think that's a really significant find. I find that very exciting. And uh, there we are again. You get more more Academy Awards, um, and uh, it, it was a really significant development in in our culture. I think. I think the amazing thing was that how James the first carried on, because uh, you wouldn't necessarily have thought he was going to be enthusiastic. And I think Shakespeare must have been rather worried. With what the king would be interested in theatre at all. It wasn't a given at all, especially uh, among uh, many people. So uh, they must have been delighted when James arrived and he, he loved it. Uh, he, he, wa he wanted to see the whole back catalogue, which uh, they showed him. And of course, he famously inspired Shakespeare to write Macbeth um, and um, other plays as well. Now we know all this in, in detail because of the Master's Revels account, which are, are stored uh, and in the National Archive. And you can see here, but on individual dates, we know individual dates each year when the performances were of particular plays. And if you can make out, so if you look in the middle page, the second entry down, um, it says the Merry Wives of Windsor. Uh, the next entry down, measure for measure. Um, and um, a couple of more entries, it talks about Shaxbird, his spelling of Shakespeare. Um, and on the right-hand side, it says on Twelfth Night. Now, that wasn't the play, because Twelfth Night is Twelfth Night After Christmas. Um, and that, that was a particular date when they have, had festivities, and that's how the play Twelfth Night got its name. But uh, you can see the important Twelfth Night and Candlemas and other uh, Shrove Tuesday they, that you can see there listed. Um, the Merchant of Venice, that was a great favourite of James. And he, he'd want them repeated uh, multiple times. So he'd love the Merchant of Venice. So the, 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 the monarchs were great patrons. That was really important. Now, I found, uh, so I worked it out what Elizabeth must have seen. Uh, so she probably saw, if she saw those plays, there were 24 plays Shakespeare produced, and of course there were other playwrights as well. Uh, so if we assume she saw them all, she saw 24 plays. She saw Hamlet, which is the Twelfth Night. Um, but I, I think it's rather sad that she was such a great lover of his work, and yet, of course, she missed uh, some of his greatest plays, which is Othello, Macbeth, King Lear. Um, but there we are. But James was a uh, certainly a, a, an inspiration uh, for Shakespeare, for King Lear as well, about kingship and so on. That was very relevant to the king. And from a Whitehall perspective, Henry VIII, the play of Henry VIII, is a, a great historical document because, of course, that was very close now in Shakespeare's term. We're only looking at a generation away when Shakespeare may well have been able to talk to those people who were in the court at the time. And the historical accounts of um, the king's behavior uh, are represented in the play. And that, that's been borne out by historical witnesses, such as the time when, when Henry uh, arrived in a mask and, and uh, uh, surprised uh, Queen Anne and so on, that's represented in, in the play. So if you want an actual script of what people were saying, albeit in Shakespeare's language, uh, I think that play is a particularly authentic uh, source. And of course, we've got a whole clutch of Oscars uh, coming straight out of Whitehall. Uh, now, I've got to give a mention here to James's wife, a remarkable lady, Anna of Denmark. She's rather forgotten, which is a shame. Uh, she was a great theater patron as well. But in particular, she introduced Inigo Jones into Whitehall. Now, Inigo Jones, as you'll see in this talk, is, is sort of a like a Indiana Jones of Whitehall. He just keeps coming back. Um, and uh, he was a remarkable man, he lived to be very old. And um, he, he had enormous influence uh, obviously on architecture, we know, but also on the theatre. Uh, he was the one that developed the masks and he developed theatre, more or less as we know it today, with proscenium arches, with um, costumes, with curtains, 
the usual things you, you think of as a traditional theater. He was the one that introduced those. If you think of Shakespeare's Globe, it was bereft of scenery, very little uh, costume. So through these, these masks, much more uh, scenic um, uh, events, he, he developed all that with Ben Johnson, who wrote a lot of the words. Ben Johnson was very much a wordsmith, and he, he thought the action should be in the words, rather like Shakespeare, and that's how they developed their theatre. But uh, Inigo Jones could see uh, that the visual side of theatre was just as important. So he, he contributed greatly to there, and the Queen was also a, a patron of the, the Queen's Men Theatre Company. Now, Inigo Jones, as an architect, he was revolutionary at the time that you'll know that's the Queen's house in Greenwich. Well, that was the first neoclassical house in the country. Uh, that was people thought that was like a spaceship landing in the Placentia Tudor Palace. And the banqueting hall he built, he rebuilt it, was burnt down. Uh, it was, although it's called the banqueting hall, it was really uh, designed to be a theatre for masks. Um, so and just to get a contrast to that, that was 1619. Well, you think the globe burnt down just before that, but you can see the contrast. You're going from a theatre that looked like the globe to the banqueting house. So it was quite stunning. And that was conceived for these uh, enormous theatrical performances. And then, of course, uh, Rubens was hired to do the ceiling, which celebrated the divine right of kings. That's James I represented. Now, to show the evidence of showing it was really designed to be a theater is, is the, the, the masks, the faces there, which uh, Inigo Jones put on because it, it was uh, about theater and that, that uh, still decorates it today. Now, this, it, it, this looks like a fantasy, this picture, but in fact, this was a fairly realistic portrayal of what a mask looked like. Uh, and you'll see there was nudity. And these was high level nudity. The queen would appear half naked uh, on the stage um, and sometimes blacked up uh, in all sorts of wild costumes. And um, th this particular scene is of Prince Charles, as he then was with his young wife, receiving the liberal arts from George Villiers, the Duke of Buckingham. Uh, and apparently that is a, a realistic uh, impression of it. Uh, so that became the basis of our opera as well. And fortunately, uh, Prince Charles then became King Charles and he became a great patron, as was his wife, Henrietta Maria. She was also a great patron of the arts and very important because she introduced Van Dyck to the court. Uh, she was uh, from France and um, in fact, she ended up after Charles's death uh, going back uh, to France. And of course, a lot of the Van Dykes did end up there. But it was a time of culture wars. We talk about cultural wars today. Of course, uh, Cromwellians uh, absolutely hated the theatre. They hated dancing. They hated music. All of those things, which uh, it's rather strange, I think, that parliamentary democracy of the 17th century uh, was so against those things. And yet it was the sort of so-called dictators, the kings, uh, who, who wanted uh, to, to rule, but and yet they were the beacons of culture and mu very much developed our culture, I think. Um, of course, it all ended badly for uh, Charles. Uh, this is the deed, and uh, as a Whitehall lawyer, I know how difficult it is getting a deed sealed, because you still have to get deed sealed in the crown. Uh, you can't just get signatures like you can for companies. So uh, it rather uh, interested me how many seals are on uh, the deed, uh, which was for, to, to use the language, uh, it was actually for severing the severance of uh, the king's head from his body, was how it was put, uh, to be in the open street in Whitehall. And it was no accident that the banqueting hall was chosen for that event, because it was the banqueting hall the Cromwellians that represented all the decadence uh, of the monarchy. Now, another great film, we get another Oscar here, uh, was the, um, the Alec Guinness uh, in Charles. And you'll see there, they, were, they also, that film took great pains to get the geography right. And you can see the Holborn Gate in the background, 
with that checkered board pattern, which is exactly right. So they, they recreated the set. So if you get a chance, it is available online, the film, get a chance to look at that and look at it from the Whitehall point of view. Uh, of course, uh, more cultural ones, because unfortunately there's a magnificent art collection that Charles and his wife had built up, um, was dispersed for uh, bargain basement prices across Europe. A lot of the great Van Dykes ended up in the Louvre. Um, that would have been an absolute magnificent collection, but it was uh, really uh, one of the uh, strange things that the parliamentarians did. But things looked up if you're if you're uh, a uh, fan of Cavaliers, because Charles II uh, came back, oh, get another Oscar for that. No, that's, a, that's another coronation. Uh, Charles II reintroduced the crown jewels, which of course had been sold off. So the crown jewels that we saw recently, um, th they are the same ones or, or very similar ones and that they've uh, been, uh, that's carried on to the present day. Uh, more culture was because of course Charles II and his wife introduced women uh, to the stage. In fact, even uh, when Charles I was uh, king, they had women in the masks. And I think that was really significant, not only for the theatre, I think it was significant for the development of women and women's rights, that the women could appear on the stage. And that all started in Whitehall. I think that was a great liberation. Um, and theatre became really important to Charles II personally. He, he really believed in it, uh, not only as a light entertainment, but a, as a way of debating ideas, of, of, of uh, being a deep part of the culture. When he was in exile in Paris, in the Louvre, he, he was so impressed that they had a, a, a theatre inside the palace, uh, which was Moliere's uh, time. And... Um, he, he thought he could see that theater should be central, not only the palace, but central to urban life, central to a civilized society. Theater should be at the center of it. Um, and not just for entertainment, but for the discussion of ideas. Um, so he, uh, he granted these um, licenses, um, there you'll see one there, um, for theater royals. And of course the first theater royals were in um, Covent Garden in Drury Lane, in the Haymarket. And they were so successful, they went out over the years to the rest of the country. Now, and by having a warrant from the king, it gave you freedom of speech because you could then debate things uh, under the authority of the king. And there was a great license if it was done in theater. And the term legitimate theater is actually taken uh, from that document. So, Charles II was really important for our culture. And of course, you had the whole restoration comedy thing come up as well, uh, which he was an inspiration for. And now our old friend Inigo Jones is back because he then commissioned uh, Jones to create a theatre in the old cockpit. So the first theatre in the round, if you like, was created uh, just behind what's now Downing Street, the cockpit in theatre. And that has now been recreated again. I just, I think this is really amazing. You talk about, you know, I said he was Indiana Jones, come back again. So last year, uh, Prescott near Liverpool uh, opened this theater, um, built to the exact designs of Inigo Jones's cockpit theater that, that were in existence. So they've recreated the cockpit in Prescott. Uh, the reason Prescott was done because there was originally uh, an Elizabethan theatre that had been built by uh, an aristocrat at that time. So there was a sort of a globe of its time there, um, long gone. So they wanted to recreate that. And, they, uh, and uh, I think that's really exciting that the, the Inigo Jones cockpit theatre, you can actually now visit it. Now, change the subject a bit, we're in Downing Street. Uh, original Downing Street there, well, of course, famously built by a Sir George Downing, uh, who had the most astonishing life. Uh, he, um, he was quite a, a reprobate. He, he, uh, he went to the American colony. He married the daughter of the Massachusetts uh, governor and um, then he managed to get the Dutch out of New York and he developed Manhattan. Consequently, there are actually two Downing Streets uh, in New York City. There's one in Manhattan 
and one in Brooklyn. So there are more in New York than there are in London. But he, he was uh, he, he was quite a crafty character because he he was all for the uh, Cromwellians. He, he pushed Cromwell he was, to execute the king, but was smart enough not to sign that deed. Uh, and then when Charles II arrived, he, he told Charles II what awful people the Cromwellians were. And he can catch the people that uh, were behind the execution of his father. So he then uh, uh, conned these uh, uh, people who'd signed the deed, who who'd fled to Holland. He brought them back to London, whereby they were all executed. Now, as a prize for that, uh, Charles II awarded this strip of land at the edge of the palace to Downing, and that's why he built his houses there, and then he died. But Downing Street gets its own Oscars, of course. Uh, we got three. George Arliss was actually got, I think it was the second Oscar uh, ever for Best Actor. Uh, so um, Downing Street itself scores three Oscars there. Uh, and I'm going to give an honorary one to Harold Wilson for introducing the Edie Levy. Because the Edie Levy, we named after a Treasury civil servant, had this ingenious scheme after the war of uh, uh, actually uh, giving a, a tax break to all revenues from, from uh, cinemas, provided it was reinvested in cinema. And that brought a lot of Hollywood film producers uh, to England. And um, it's why we got the James Bond films and so on. The American producers came to London. So we get an Oscar off there. Now, James II comes along. He's, he, of course, uh, there, uh, there's the crown jewels. You, you, you would have uh, seen them being used recently. Uh, he had a great big uh, coronation, but of course it didn't last long. I've called it the Churchill insurrection. John Churchill was really a, a, a prime mover in that. Uh, so it was glorious because there was no bloodshed. And of course, uh, James being, a, he got just too Catholic for, for Parliament. So he uh, got in a boat, literally, um, on the Thames and uh, made off. And then, of course, his sister became queen with King William. And that became, uh, the under the Declaration of Right, it was declared in the banqueting hall, they were declared uh, king and queen. There was subsequently a coronation, but the the ceremony was symbolically in the banqueting hall and that really established constitutional monarchy because the monarch uh, under the terms of that declaration was to be subject to parliament and the laws. And that declaration became the Bill of Rights, which became an act of parliament. Now, just to pick up on our American July the 4th theme, the de declaration of right was the exact model that Jefferson used for the declaration of independence. And he, he saw a parallel with James II being removed uh, to what they were trying to do in the American provinces. So we've got Whitehall Palace. There were several fires. And that was really the end of the, the palace, pretty much. It was pretty uh, engulfed, most of it, except uh, the banqueting hall, which was preserved. Now, Queen Anne did live a lot of her life in Whitehall. So I've included here... The, the, the most remarkable story I found about Queen Anne was during that glorious revolution, when her husband, Prince George of Denmark and John Churchill, they were the prime movers behind the insurrection. And uh, James II realized this, uh, so he couldn't find them, but he locked up their wives. And it was at that time, she, she was the wife of uh, Prince George. And uh, he, she, he locked them up in the cockpit theater. They were under house arrest in the cockpit theatre for several days. So you really can't get more dramatic than that. It's a shame it hasn't been dramatised. I think they missed a trick there in that film. Um, now, so the monarchy is now, the royalty is now sort of left Whitehall. The aristocrats move in. They start building it up with grand houses. And fortunately, there was a notable architect. He really was a professional architect. He studied architecture at Oxford. Uh, the Earl of Pembroke. That uh, house in the middle was actually is Marble Hill House in Twickenham. But those were the sort of houses that he built along Whitehall. It gives you an idea. And they really became the model of what we now think of a stately home, the plantation homes in America, that neoclassical home, which we all take for granted now, seems perfectly ordinary. Uh, it was really revolutionary at that time to build houses in this neoclassical style. Um, some of them have been preserved. 
Now, in the MOD main building, when they put that up, they did knock down some of those 18th century uh, aristocratic houses. And they, the more remarkable rooms they preserved and have put into the MOD building. Uh, which might explain why, uh, in the, well, for your eyes only, uh, Bond actually, he's, he's actually seen to go into the MOD main building, uh, goes up to Q's office. Uh, and, you know, if you might wonder why, why is it all panelled 18th century in Q's office? Well, that could explain why it's sort of authentic, because Q could have had one of these uh, preserved rooms. Um, so it sort of all makes sense. And, of course, Ian Fleming was a, a civil servant in the Admiralty uh, in the war. And um, he wrote, uh, he used For Your Eyes Only, a, a, a spoof of really... Uh, uh, Whitehall confidentiality. Moving on in the 18th century, Holborn Gate still surviving. There's the banqueting hall on the left. Um, it didn't last much longer, though. They really needed to widen the road. Now, the architecture, we're going to, Inigo Jones will come back, but I think Whitehall was really a, a leading place for architecture. Palladio, you would have heard, of the great Italian architect who adapted the, the classical ancient Greek and Roman principles to modern architecture of the 17th century. Christopher Wren adopted that. He loved the cupola. And of course, cupolas in one form or another are a real characteristic of Whitehall, uh, along with the sort of Edwardian Baroque. And that Wren's Naval College became some of those motifs you see in Whitehall. And that's uh, Chiswick House down there. That's the Palladio design. Um, rather alarmingly configured in Scotland House. Now that is actually when the Holborn Gate came down, that, that's, that, that is just where the Holborn Gate was. Um, I find this rather amusing, this concoction of the architect trying to follow classical principles, but seemed to get it all wrong. <laughs> they wrote, it built sort of a, a, a Palladian house, but then of course domes became very fashionable. So they thought, well, where are we going to put the dome? Well, no, we'll, we'll put it at the entrance. Uh, but, but they had the big wall to keep out the um, the, the population. Uh, but oh, we need some iconic, uh, some ionic arches, uh, you know, columns. So they put that in the front of the wall. So I find it quite an uh, uh, amusing bit of architecture. But what it's what happened inside was so dramatic because that's the rear of it, uh, rather traditional. And this actually scores another film because this was the house of Lady Caroline Lamb who you may know if you've seen that film or read the book, uh, Antonio Fraser, uh, was a, a great torrid affair, a great scandal at the time, because it, it was a, an affair that was carried out openly, uh, in particular uh, in what became known as Scotland House. And I have visited there several times on different occasions, and it, you still see the architectural uh, features of it. So you can still sort of imagine, I've been upstairs into what used to be the bedrooms and things, that, and uh, you, you can't help imagining what was going on there um, before. So moving on, we've got Westminster Bridge there, bottom right is uh, 1750. That developed the geography a bit. Now, the southern bit of uh, Whitehall, they, they opened up a new street there, Parliament Street. That still exists today, uh, which explains why that tail end of Whitehall is called Parliament Street. Uh, King Street's still there. And then you'll see various higgledy-piggledy so little roads and alleyways and things, uh, which was a very popular place to go. And there's, you see, Downing Street there as the uh, what became the most famous uh, sort of cul-de-sac. Uh, but we're just going to look a little bit more around these streets here, because these were some remarkable coaching inns. Uh, and, um, of course, if you wanted a, a coach going around the country, you'd go to one of these. And the, the, a lot of history occurred in these rooms and um, Samuel Pepys um, records going to the Blue Boar Inn and, uh, and the George and, and so on. So they really were the places to go after work. Uh, of course, Pepys was also a civil servant in the Admiralty. There he is. Uh, that, that's the, the Blue Boar's head. Uh, it was there, as you see, for uh, over 500 years uh, until the government building went up. Um, and that gives you a, an idea of what was in King Street, some quite substantial uh, Tudor buildings there. Um, Montague House uh, was the home of uh, the uh, 
Yerl of Sandwich. Uh, uh, and he was credited with uh, inventing the sandwich. He was the first Lord of the Admiralty. So I, I'm speculating he must have uh, worked in the Admiralty and, uh, you know, he'd, he'd get hungry and um, he, he'd worked out what he needed for lunch. But I, I'm, I'm wondering what this queue is. This is his house. Uh, which is about where MOD main building is now. And there seems to be a queue forming. So I wonder if that was actually the uh, first London sandwich bar. And he's uh, doing good business there. The right-hand side, that's the back of Montague House. So we're looking now to the Holborn Gate uh, from the Parliament Square end. You can still see the remnants of Woolsey's formal gardens uh, and a little bit of the remnants still is there in front of the MOD main building today, that little bit of grass, which is nice to think that's never been built over, that's always been uh, undeveloped, and it's just a remnant of Woolsey's York Place. So that's how it became quite a sedate through fair, that Parliament Street. Now, here's our July the 4th tribute. Um, of course, they, Whitehall didn't know about uh, this insurrection in Pennsylvania until some time after. In fact, it was a letter from Canada that was published in the London Gazette on the 27th of July that first gave an inkling of, uh, of, of this, uh, what, what had been going on here. Uh, so you can imagine Lord North, that's, uh, that's not the king, that's Lord North, because they are curiously similar in appearance. Uh, you can imagine Lord North beetling from Downing Street over here, this is Horse Guards, he didn't live in, in Downing Street, he had his office there, and he lived in Queen Anne, what we now call Queen Anne's Gate, one of those houses. Um, and uh, of course, he was thinking, how am I going to tell the king this? Well, the king must have been mad because the Declaration of Independence uh, made out the king was this terrible tyrant. Of course, it was Parliament, really, uh, which was responsible for a lot of the problems uh, they had. But the uh, Benjamin Franklin's house, uh, you may have visited, it was just at the end of Whitehall, Franklin was the uh, ambassador for Pennsylvania, actually, for many years. And uh, uh, I just thought I'd commemorate here the uh, provinces, as they were actually called. They weren't called colonies, they were called provinces in those days. Uh, but they feature some Whitehall monarchs, because we've got uh, Carolina, uh, Charles II named that after his father, Charles, uh, Latin for Carol. Virginia, of course, Elizabeth. Uh, New York was... Um, James II, that he, when he was Duke of York. So he's commemorated just about every day. He probably most famously of all. Uh, Pennsylvania, Charles II owed a lot of money to uh, William Penn. Uh, so to pay it off, he gave his son this estate there. But uh, the story goes that he said that William Penn was such a blood-sucking creditor. Uh, you, he said you can call it... Pennsylvania after Dracula's estate. How about that? Well, moving on to 1815, that gives you an idea. There are the two streets. There's um, uh, King Street, and then you've got Parliament Street there. Uh, another coronation. Uh, Queen Caroline, of course, was uh, famously barred. And she, uh, we think we have scandals today with Prince Harry. Is he going to go to uh, the... Uh, the ceremony well queen caroline did go but they wouldn't let her in and she banged on the door uh, and they she wasn't allowed into her own coronation so uh the, the scandal and the cock-ups that used to ha happen in previous coronations uh, uh you could make films about now moving on into the development of whitehall more or less the infrastructure we know today uh Soane was very important uh architect at the time you know his house in lincoln's inn uh, designed a lot of buildings. Unfortunately, a lot of them haven't survived, and a lot of his designs weren't built. I think it's a great shame. But he did design the cabinet office. But Barry then came along and gave it a rather heavier look. Uh, Soane's design is on the top, and then Barry took away the uh, neoclassical columns. Now that's what we call the Foreign Office today. Um, but in fact, it was built as several different government departments. So you'll see here it was just this top left corner was the foreign office this was the india office uh and then the colonial office uh was here uh and then the uh, another government office here and this was the home office here uh and then along here charles street has been there for centuries but 
you, you may have noticed that's actually now called, you'll see there, it's called King Charles Street. I think this was, my, this is my guess, uh, very clever, because uh, when they built over all these streets in about 1900 with the government buildings, King Street, of course, was, was uh, uh, built over. So I suspect that the, the planners thought, well, it's a shame that King Street won't be remembered. So they rather cleverly put the word King in front of Charles. So the word King Street is commemorated in Charles Street. That's my theory anyway. Uh, there's the Home Office. So Remembrance Day, Sunday, uh, when you see the, uh, the, the royals and so on, walk out of uh, that building, which you think is a foreign office. Actually, that's the old main entrance to the Home Office. And it was the Home Office for 100 years before it moved to Petty France. The Cenotaph uh, is Greek for empty tomb. And it was empty because uh, it was symbolic of the fact that there was a rule that no um, deceased uh, veteran soldiers uh, were to be transported back to Britain from France. They're all buried in France. Uh, and the families really grieved at that, that they couldn't bury their loved ones. And Lutchens, the designer, uh, wanted to reflect that, that it was the empty tomb that, that people had to face, which is why they also had the tomb of the unknown soldier in Westminster Abbey, uh, which is a real person, of course, unknown. And that was in those days, right after the First World War, was a really important ceremony. And tens of thousands of people used to come to these memorials uh, to grieve, uh, so much so that they decided they needed to organize it more formally. Uh, and that's how Remembrance Sunday uh, occurred. Now, in the Foreign Office, uh, they say it's the nation's living room. Uh, those are the Locarno suites uh, after the uh, defunct treaty after the Second World War, but that was, uh, sorry, our First World War. Uh, but they've got grand staircases that reflect the themes of India, the colonies, uh, and so on for each one. I think designed to uh, impress the uh, ambassadors and foreign visitors. So that's the banqueting hall there on the left, and that's the reception hall there on the right. Uh, the Durbar Court was used in the coronation 1902, and uh, of course Durbar is a collection of, of Indian princes and so on, Maharajas, and they all collected in the court, and that's why it's called the Maharaja, the, sorry, the Durbar Court. So uh, government buildings, uh, Great George uh, Street government buildings, GOGs as they called it, uh, went up in two stages, took about 20 years to build it because there were so many different legal titles that had to be acquired and there are four acts of parliament to do it. So you'll see there, that's only half the building. Uh, another half still has to go up. Uh, this was the site of the first traffic light. That was even before um, motor cars. Uh, and here we are, here's our in Inigo Jones again, uh, because Bryden, who was the architect of the government buildings, wanted to pay tribute to Inigo Jones and he used Inigo Jones's designs. There they are on the right. Uh, and which, of course, never actually put into practice. So his designs were uh, very much designed uh, around Inigo Jones, and I think it's great tribute to Inigo Jones. In, in particular, the drum, that circular uh, building, to create light and air in these government offices. They were very forward-looking. In fact, Bryden had this weird idea of um, open-plan offices. Uh, Unfortunately, he died. It took so long and the, the architect took over. I didn't understand this at all and built lots of uh, compartments. But uh, 20 years ago, all those were knocked down and wall hundreds of miles, no, tens of about 30 miles. I think a wall was demolished to make it open plan again. And that, that's what that there's that drum that uh, Inigo Jones had in his mind. Of course, it was a great scene uh, when the news came through of Germany's surrender. Churchill. Uh, went straight up in that building he was in and he went straight on to the balcony and he famously said to the crowd, this is your victory. Now across the road, got several uh, listed buildings. That, that, all those buildings are listed. They were going to knock them down in the early 70s and there was a big protest. So the, the facades are listed. The actual buildings behind have all been rebuilt. It's all part of the parliamentary estate. So it's all parliamentary offices. In fact, if you're a, a, a staff of parliament, you enter one of those front doors and that then takes you a sort of James Bond-like into this much more modern complex. But the, the building I find particularly interesting is the old uh, bank building there, 
Um, again, Coppola. Uh, now, that was particularly remarkable because um, it was the Bank for India. If you were in the colonies, particularly India and the Far East, and you wanted to get money to your family or they wanted to get money to you, you'd always go through this bank. And so it was very well known at the time. So it was preserved. Sometimes those curtains are open. If you walk past it, they did preserve, and it's still there, it is the counting hall. And it's beautiful wood paneled with a with a chandelier. Um, so have a glimpse through it. Um, it, it. It does look beautiful. Now we get to this extraordinary building, I think, uh, the, the old war office, as it's called now. Uh, just recently been made into a hotel. Uh, but what strikes me about this building is it doesn't say anything about war to me. It was the headquarters of the army. That's what they meant. The war office. Uh, I mean, how, how, what, what were they thinking of to build that as the center for the army? Well, this might give you a clue. Prince George of Cambridge, he was the grandson of uh, a uh, George the uh, third. Um, he was actually uh, born in Hanover, uh, and then he was made commander in chief of the army, age thirty-seven. He, he carried on till he was seventy-six, uh, and his mentality, I think, uh, uh, rather set the tone. He, and these are actual quotes of his: "He's brains. I don't believe in brains. You haven't any. I know, sir. So I'll promote you." Uh, apparently, that's what he said to General Hay. There, there is a time for everything, and a time for change is when you can no longer help it. Well, this was the sort of mentality, of course, that led to uh, First World War, and that his great protege was Field Marshal Haig. So, my theory about the old War Office is Prince George wanted his own palace, which you can see um, now, because uh, now the Raffles Hotel is. Uh, opening very soon, if not already open. Uh, so you can uh, see what um, the offices I used to go to when they they first had to uh, resurrect the Department of Trade. They 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 uh, took they dusted off the mothballs of this and used it temporarily. So it, it was quite impressive, but they've done quite a job on it. Uh, so you'll see the that's one of the cupolas at the bottom, and one of the ministerial rooms there. That's the Secretary of State's office, uh, as it was. Uh, below and as it is now. So all for you to explore. Now across the road, we've got the Admiralty House, 1788. First the home of the Duke of Buckingham, who I mentioned, and then rebuilt in 1788. Uh, first Lord of the Re Admiralty. Of course, they, they were separate services until 1964, so the Navy was quite separate. First Lord was a, a political appointment, and famously Churchill was forced Lord twice. Um, and then behind that is the old Admiralty buildings, which was the scene of another film, uh, Operation Mincemeat, The Man Who Never Was, uh, was conceived there. And Ian Fleming also had an office in there in the war. That's now the home of the government art collection, among other government departments. Admiralty, nothing to do with Navy anymore, but they still kept the old radio mast. Uh, and that's uh, in the corner there. That's um, Admiralty House there. Uh, not to be confused with the Admiralty. So that's th this building here, uh, rather odd shaped on the wings. That's the Admiralty. That's now regular government offices. Uh, it's now called the Ripley House after the architect, uh, much mocked by other architects at the time, in particular John Vanbrugh, uh, who, who thought it was highly amusing. He thought it was an absolute disaster of trying to be neoclassical. But I mean, Ripley had a bit of a job trying to fit it in that space. That's the famous. Um, a boardroom for the Admiralty, which is still used by the Admiralty on the right. And that's a weather vane to show they know which way the wind is blowing, um, which they needed for the Navy. The wall that went up, which was an early Adam creation, it went up because sailors would come looking to be paid and would be riot uh, the Admiralty. So that is purely for security. And then on the left, you've got Admiralty House there. So that tends to be flats for ministers and so on, and, and it's sort of like a little stately home. But these are now regular government offices, and we'll be looking at this building here on the right as well in a minute. Uh, Great Sutton Yard on the other side. Um, that uh, was, of course, the scene of the famous police station. It was blown up by the Fenians in the 19th century. Uh, so that facade was uh, rebuilt after uh, the police moved out. Um, the Civil Service Club was uh, not the old fire station next to the police station. 
Um, the uh, civil servants did a whip round for the queen when she uh, became queen. There was a surplus from the gift. So the queen said, you must buy yourself something. So it was decided to buy a club. It's a self-financing club, but it's open to all civil servants of any grade. And there is accommodation there and very reasonable premises. Now, the fire on the left, I find rather intriguing. That hotel, it's worth visiting. It's quite an interesting hotel to be made into, the Great Scotland Yard Hotel. Uh, and it's got this Scandinavian restaurant and everything is um, cooked over an open fire. If you keep going down Scotland Yard, you you will get to the Corinthia Hotel as it is now. Uh, now all of those great hotels that were built up in Northumberland Avenue in the Victorian period, and they really were landmark hotels, uh, were requisitioned in the First World War for the uh, defence. Um, and it's only in the last 20 years have they been released again, and now they're uh, fittingly really grand hotels, but you can wander around there and you can imagine what war planning uh, used to occur in those hotels. The, uh, we're now moving right to the end of uh, the street. Um, now, although this is now, this end of the street, but this is uh, Trafalgar Square we're getting into, um, the, this was, until about 1920s, always called Charing Cross, this area of the street. Uh, it's been called Whitehall up until about Drummond's Bank now. Uh, but it is actually Charing Cross, and this was a real centre for London. Uh, and the street layout is as it is today. The, the, that courtyard is still there. There is a bank there, which is now a pub. Uh, that was a military bank. Um, worth visiting. Uh, if you go down into the basement, there's an enormous vault, which is now a bar. Uh, and it's really got a sense of history to it. Now, I, th I think this area of London, we tend to sort of bit right off as a sort of tourist uh, beehive. But in fact, the, all these pubs are really historic. And I think it's really fitting that it's always been a really lively area of London, so it is today. Now we're going to move across that new street, that's still there, that, that's now the Admiralty Buildings, and we're just going to have a look here. Um, that building there, which was rebuilt in the 1920s, was uh, the Glynn's Bank, which you may remain, remember Williams and Glynn, it was uh, then taken over by Nat West, but the original Glynn Bank, and then you'll see here uh, underneath Holtz, that was another military bank. One was, I think it was to serve the Navy. So, um, and Sir Richard Glynn lived in what was, what became built as, as the Admiralty House. So he had his bank here. Uh, and there were several banks grew up around either the military or the aristocracy uh, in Whitehall. So this was sort of the banking district, really. There were several banks uh, along here. Uh, they've all, they all still exist in one way or another. They've all been taken over by the big banks. Uh, which still perform uh, banking for the military. But this is really where it started. And uh, Richard Glynn, uh, it was a great surprise when he published his accounts. Uh, they, they didn't, the, the, the city didn't really rate Glynn's bank. They thought it was pretty uh, minor. And then he published his accounts of, it, of assets. And, and the, the city banks were astonished at how, mu how much he had in deposits. Uh, so he, he, was, he did extremely well. Now, there is a plaque on that building uh, commemorating the uh, foundation of New Zealand. It, it was a bit of a fiasco, actually, but then the, you, you look at the, uh, the poster that the Canterbury Association then put out to start this colony uh, in New Zealand. Uh, there's enough to put anyway. Emigration for the working classes. Uh, come and by, by the Archbishop of Canterbury. And they, I don't know why they thought that was going to be a success. But um, Christ Church Cathedral there in New Zealand, same architect as the Foreign Office. So a bit of a connection there. And of course, we'll get another Oscar. The piano film, not exactly about the uh, this story, but it, exactly that time. If you want a feeling of that time when New Zealand was created, that does tell that story. Uh, another coronation we'll throw in there. I think this really tells you why, how you, you we, we get to the uh, Cheapside Cross, uh, well, the Charing Cross, which, of course, was uh, Edward the uh, uh, Sixth built these crosses uh, for his wife, Eleanor, in 1291. And the last was at Charing Cross, which is there. Of course, it's not at the railway station, and that cross at the railway station is the Victorian confection. Uh, so the real Charing Cross is here. And this address 
Charing Cross still does exist. There are, I think, one to four Charing Cross. I think Drummond's Bank there, which, of course, got great history. The Royal Bank uh, was always been on that site. Um, that uh, is still there. Uh, and this was really a, a real centre. And you'll see there, uh, it was a great place to uh, pillory people. Um, and uh, then it was developed more into the square by John Nash had this conception of going from Whitehall all the way up to Regent's Park. And then this was all part of the plan uh, to open that up. So they knocked down the buildings on the far side, on the Trafalgar Square side. And the uh, it was commemorated. Dickens liked talking about it. it the, there was a famous pub there, the Silver Cross, which Dickens uh, talked about in great detail as a coaching inn, and also Piers and David Copperfield, which just shows you just how important uh, that area of London was for Victorian life. The Victorians would have known it. And I, I think it's rather nice now that all those pubs are still there. And yes, they attract a lot of tourists now, but it, it's still got that great life, I think, that must have existed uh, in those days. And it's still sort of the centre of the world. People come from all over the world and you can meet them in those pubs. And I, I actually love those pubs for it. I think it's great life to it. But there's to conclude our uh, talk, bring us up to date. There's um, uh, Charles III passing uh, Charles I, which uh, is on the site of the old Charing Cross, uh, the Eleanor Cross. That statue of Charles I, incidentally, was contemporaneous. It was made during his reign and then was hidden uh, during the Cromwellian time uh, and then was brought out um, and it was very deliberately placed there uh, because it then facing down to the place of execution uh, in triumph. But I think we'll give one final Oscar to uh, Larry the Cat, how about that? And that's the uh, conclusion. Thank you very much. Open to the floor. Very interested in your comments. Thank you so much, Brian. Wow, what a lot of um, lovely slides and a great story, a great story. I forgot to mention before you started, if anybody did have any questions, put it in the chat. But um, if you'd like to unmute yourself, if anybody has any questions or comments, I'd just like to say uh, Trafalgar Square. Um, so um all the measurements all the um uh street signs that say london 50 miles all done from sort of charing cross i suppose from the cross yeah uh, right. Square. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that really is the center of london yeah. Yeah. absolutely absolutely um interesting to see the corinthia hotel has got a lovely rooftop um yeah. i'll uh maybe go visit that yeah and um you mentioned benjamin franklin's house um is that open in whitehall for visitors craven street which is just between whitehall and charing cross station so it's a back street yes it is you, it, it uh, it's preparing visitors you so it's been preserved and it's still very much i think more or less as he was when he was there so it's quite an impressive little museum they've, they've got the whole house there's a website uh so it's um, worth a visit, yeah. Okay, lovely. The other thing I found really interesting was the Master of the Revels, the 1604 um, list of the, of, the, of the plays. Now, has anybody else got any questions? Uh, I haven't got really got a question, but it's just about the the art collection that Charles I assembles, these 1700 paintings, which were then sold off by basically by Cromwell. Um, and what, there was an exhibition, I think, at the Royal Academy about four or five yeah. years ago, mm -hmm. about, about, not, about, not all 1700. Yeah, they, they, they brought the collection back together. Yeah. Uh, but of course, Academy. had those paintings not been sold off, they probably want to. They probably would have gone up in flames, wouldn't they, in sixteen ninety eight? So That's a good point. Good point. I hadn't thought of that. So you know, yeah. not, not not a huge fan of Cromwell, but he might have inadvertently done us all. No, you're right. I absolutely right. Yes, interesting observation. Yes. 
So, so we're, maybe I've been unfair to Cromwell. He saved the collection for the next yeah. for the world. <laughs> in, in the Even if most of it's in the Louvre. Yeah. <laughs> We, of course, we, we got a bit of our own back from France after the French Revolution. We, we acquired a lot of the uh, paintings like in the Wallace collection, didn't we? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've got a fair old list of films here that I, I'll be um, uh, trying to watch. Yeah. The Dis I actually live in Buckinghamshire, so the Disraeli... Yeah. Um, who was the? Can you remember off the top of your head who the? I put the actor George. George Arliss. Arliss, thank you. So he got Best Actor Academy Award. I think it was the second time. It was in very early days of the Academy Awards. Yeah, I haven't seen the film, so I'm rather intrigued to see the film. Yeah. I'll see. If so I think it's quite good. You know, we have got British Prime Minister there <laughs> represented gets Best Actor. I mean, you, you think uh, the British dominance of. Uh, Hollywood, one way or another, it's quite astonishing. I think over the years, and uh, the uh, and Whitehall, one way or another, you know, and I, I just sort of discovered this. I went on. There's just the number of stories that that are dramatised. We're continually, and people are continually fascinated with stories that basically happened. You know, the real life happened in Whitehall, and of course, the dramas, the actual plays themselves were actually premiered in Whitehall and theatre was developed in Whitehall in a really significant way and it is thanks to our monarchs really that that, that happened. Yeah absolutely I had no idea about all that um, the the arts connection yeah. Would anybody else like to comment on anything that Brian has said? and shown us. Okay. All right then. Right, so I think we'll draw draw to a close. Thank you so much, Brian. Okay. If everyone would like to unmute and perhaps give a little round of applause. Absolutely. Thank Don't you. know what this Thank is. Thank you very about. much. <laughs>